College of Arts. Uh, he received his PhD in Islamic History and Civilization at the University of Durham in the United Kingdom and his MA uh, from the University of Chicago. Uh, he ac actually stayed at the University of Chicago also quite a while. Um, his research focuses on issues of political organization and legitimacy in early Islam uh, in both the Umayyad and the Abbasid periods. Uh, he is the author of many articles in Arabic, more than 10, uh, and a book in English called Political Legitimacy in Early Islam, published in 2009. Today, he will expand upon this work in a lecture that is titled Political Legitimacy in Early Islam, the same title of his book, uh, Understanding the Umayyad Model. Please join me in welcoming Abdel Hadi Al-Ajmi to Berkeley. First, uh, let me thank you, Professor, for the invitation and for giving me the time to speak about such an issue that is so old, but we bring it back again. And it seems obviously that still certain people have an interest in the issue. Is it in the issue of the Umayyad or the whole topic of legitimacy in Islam? And as you know now, it's the focused discussion in the whole Arabia or Islamic uh, countries is the whole idea of legitimacy. And if someone have noticed that Morsi, in his famous five-hour speech, the last one, he repeated the word legitimacy, shari'iyah, said around 300 times in one speech. And that will tell you something about this, this concept, shari'iyah, or legitimacy, and the debate. And why would the Umayyad be so important even for a discussion still exists now. It's because the Umayyad are the bridge out of the ideal position for the Islamic civilization, which is the rightly guided caliphs. The rightly guided caliph represent the moment, at least in the mind of the Muslims, uh, the moment where the legitimacy was right in a certain level. And the Umayyad are the bridge out of that ideal position to the reality something where people would criticize and disagree with. The system of the Umayyad attract the attention of scholars, especially Western scholarship have dealt with the Umayyad legitimacy in a different way. Early scholarship looked to the Umayyad from a light that they seem to be more interesting than the Abbasid because they represent, in a way, a secular understanding of the state. For Wilhausen, for example, he thought it's a tribal system. It's an Arab leaders who can manage to work well with different tribes to create this state, which is the largest Islamic state. It's the Umayyad. So for Wilhausen, the tribal s s dimension of the whole system, it's what's worth noticing. Uh, Lamans took the same issue again, but Lamans looked to them as a real politics. The Umayyad are uh, people with no aspect of religious dimension to the way they rule. So he admired that dimension. He admired they not building their policy based in religion, and they make them secular in a way, and he, that attracted him to a certain level. It stayed that way, looking to the Umayyad, to be the real politics away from the rightly guided caliph who ruled by religion and used religion. No, during the Umayyad time, religion is less important and tribal and reality and politics based in the needs of the society is what uh, took place. For state, the same field, the field went around in this argument until Patricia Cron and Meinter Heinz published their God Caliph's book and in that book, they argued in a different way. They brought the religious dimension for the Umayyad and they said, no, the Umayyad is not only religious, they even more religious than the Abbasid. And they saw themselves as, in a way, they used this term that they, the similar model for Umayyad leader is the concept of Imam in a Shi'i thought, which is someone who 
governing the, the Muslim society, but he is the religious leader, and he has the right to give fatwa to make religious decision. Cronin uh, and Heinz build their argument in many evidence talking about God Caliph, but they use the term to indicate something and to create an argument out of this term. If he is, if he is God deputy, if he is Khalifatullah, that means he have the same capacity in a way that Allah have in, in, in running the society. One of the major evidence that sh they used is a letter written by Al-Walid. If you look to, to the diagram that you have here, I, I try to so it's make it easy for, for everyone to know where is Al-Walid. Al-Walid is almost Al-Walid ibn Yazid. Is, he's the one before the last caliph. Uh, and he's the end of the Umayyad dynasty in a way. 743 he start his reign, it's 126. Al-Walid letter is very important because it's the only letter what we have in the tradition, in the whole tradition, where someone, a leader of the Muslim community, have talked about the system, explain what does it mean to have a caliphate, what is the caliphate itself, what is the role of the caliph, what is the role of the prophet, what is the main uh, main idea behind the Islamic Caliphate. And it's the only letter we have in such a way. We do not have a similar to letter to before it. Yuri Rubin, another scholar who used the same material, he wrote about also the same letter, Al-Walid letter, but he argued in a different way. Same, holding the same position that the Umayyad are religious and they use religion in their legitimacy. However, they, he refuted uh, Patricia Cron and uh, Martin Hines' argument that they never saw themselves as a line connected to Allah. They saw themselves as a continuation of the Prophet mission. Because Cron uh, and Hines argued that the Umayyad tied themselves to Allah to avoid the Prophet and that era and to make themselves directly deputy of Allah. Uh, Yuri Robin go the opposite and say no. They recognize the Prophet. They see themselves as a continuation of the Prophet mission, not directly connected to Allah, but through the Prophet they are connected to Allah because the letter itself does indicate such. Stephen Judd, another scholar who, I, I bring those scholar to argue with them later on. Stephen Judd used the same letter, which is Al-Walid letter. And to speak also about how Al-Walid is a religious person himself. It's not only he's using religion, he himself is a religious person because the way he speaks in the letter about himself. And Stephen Judd used another evidence, one of the my famous poem. Uh, attributed to Al-Walid in uh, Kitab Al-Aghani Al-Asfahani where Al-Walid talk about himself that he gave a speech, a, a khutbah, a, a prayer, a Friday prayer. He, there was no khatib and he decided to give the khutbah and that khutbah was a poem. He said the whole thing is a, one poem where in that poem he described himself as a nasih and nadir. Stephen Judd, take these two terms with the term Khalifatullah put them together and create a, uh, an argument that Al-Walid thought of himself as a nasih or an advisor for the society, and Adir is someone who will warn the society about a uh, bad thing, and also a Khalifa to Allah. So he created this argument of how religious was Al-Walid. This is talking about this letter. All of them use the same letter. It's a unique letter because it's the only letter that presents this general Umayyad argument about Al-Khilafa, about the whole system. Uh, and it's unique also because the way that, uh, that Al-Walid used it, actually it was a letter sent by Al-Walid to every uh, governor to give it to the Khatib of the Jum'ah to read it for the public. So it's a, politic, it's a religious and political speech that designed 
to uh, declare who will be the heir after Al-Walid. So the letter main uh, or the objective, the, the goal of the letter is to appoint his two sons. Al-Walid have two sons, Abdul Malik and Uthman. He chose them to be his heir after him. Uh, this letter, again, you cannot read, understand it without re uh, understanding the historical development of the Umayyad. If you read the te this text alone, it will not help you to have uh, a clear understanding where, did, where does this letter itself fit in the whole journey of uh, Umayyad system. I'll give, uh, um, again, I will go back to Mercy's speech because it will help to understand this speech. If someone would study Morsi's speech to understand the Egyptian politics for the last 50 years, you will find it awkward because you will say none of the previous leaders of Egypt have given such a speech. And not only that, the same language, everything in this speech is different than what before it. And this is the same case we have with this letter. All of those scholars have used this speech or this letter to be uh, as a manifesto for Umayyad ideology or as a model to understand the Umayyad uh, uh, legitimacy. I argue that actually it's the opposite. This is the going away from Umayyad practices. It's similar to Morsi's speech. Morsi's speech do not show Egyptian policies for the last 50 years, no. It actually showed the moment that some change happened. And without understanding this issues around it, you will not, uh, if, if, you, if you treat this speech as a blueprint for Umayyad system, you will end up in a, in a bad uh, conclusion. What is it to understand about the Umayyad? Why is it very important? Understanding the Umayyad system, you will have to remember there is two types of dynasties. Actually, it's one dynasty, but with two branches. If you see this letter that they passed, there is the Marwanid and there is the Sufyanid, both called Umayyad. Sufyans are the ones who started the dynasties, and Marwanids later on. The Sufyanids, only three. It is Muawiyah, his son Yazid, after him Muawiyah, who decided to uh, impeach himself and leave the position without even pointing anyone. That in itself, a development uh, without more of theoretical background. Most of the argument about how did the Umayyad come to exist, actually it's the battle itself between Ali and Muawiyah, which I don't want to go deep into, uh, into that. But the important thing after the Muawiyah, the second, impeach himself, there is a vacuum of power in the Umayyad system. A very important meeting took place called the Al Jabiya meeting. It's very important because it's the only moment that certain elite get together and thought how should we choose a leader. And in that moment, they decided the one we should choose should be from the Umayyad family. It is in this moment the issue of Umayyad dynasty came to exist in the mind of those elite in Syria. Of course, there is someone else declared him caliph, which is Ibn Zubair in Mecca. However, this meeting is the basis of what we, with what I call the Umayyad legitimacy later on, which is Mu'tamar al-Jabiya or al-Jabiya conference, where all the tribal leaders, Yemeni majorly, Yemeni tribal leaders with Umayyad Princes have get together and decide we should choose someone from the Umayyad family to be the caliph. That in itself was a creation of Umayyad legitimacy. For I argue that Umayyad legitimacy was based in the agreement of tri tribal powerful leaders with the Umayyad princes to choose someone. And in that moment they chose uh, Marwan ibn al-Hakam. Marwan have chosen two heirs. He chose his son, Abdul Malik, after him. And after Abdul Malik, he chose Abdul Aziz. In the time of Abdul Malik, a good idea came to appoint his son as a heir and impeach his brother. But he discovered that is 
little bit hard. He cannot do it. He cannot impeach his brother for certain balance in the system itself. After him, after Abdul Aziz died, he appointed his son, Al Walid Azahir, and after Al Walid Sulaiman. When Al Walid became a caliph, he had the same idea he wanted to impeach his brother and appointed his son. And that was with the suggestion of Al Hajjaj. But even this thing he could not manage to do. Al Walid, though he had all the capacity and he is the caliph, could not impeach the heir. Which shows you that the caliph, despite all of the argument about how holy he is or how powerful he is, he cannot decide simple thing like choosing his heir. So Al Walid could not change the heir and Sulaiman became a caliph. Sulaiman chose two heirs after him, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz and uh, uh, Yazid ibn Abdul Malik. Umar ibn Aziz could not the same change the heir and kept until Yazid ibn Abdul Malik. During Yazid ibn Abdul Malik, he chose two heirs. He chose Hisham, his brother, and his son Al Walid, is the one who sent this letter. Hisham ruled around 20 years and worked very hard to impeach Al Walid, the one with this letter we're talking about. He did everything, strong propaganda against Al Walid in order to impeach him. Hundreds of stories in the tradition about how bad Al Walid is. One story I should bring just to show you a model. And what Hisham, the story go like this, that Hisham decided to to test Al Walid or to give him chance to be a better person and he sent him as a leader of the Hajj. And Al Walid decided to take his hunting dog. You know in Mecca you should not hunt, you cannot hunt at all. But to carry the dogs with you to Mecca and that is one thing. Of course the story has more detail of how bad was Al Walid. But the important thing when he reached Mecca he decided to drink and uh, to drink alcohol, and there it was in Hajj time. But you would say, okay, maybe he, he have something with, he cannot stop drinking and he needed to drink in Mecca. But he decided to drink in top of Al-Kaaba. And he talked with his friends and said, he want to drink in top of Al-Kaaba. And his friends said, oh, it's a good idea, but you know what, it might be dangerous. Let's forget about it. Such story will tell you to which level this guy was demonized or being uh, attacked strongly in, in the moral characters. But that for a reason. There is a project from the state to impeach him. So Hisham did everything, even had a fatwa from different scholars to impeach Al Walid. But still, he could not do it. And that's something. Those scholars who argue about the caliph to be holy do not witness there is something that caliph cannot do even with the title such as Khalifatullah or a title representative of God. And you say, if he's so holy, he cannot impeach his here. What does holiness mean in that regard? Again, Al Walid become, became a caliph. Of course, each caliph in order to uh, guarantee the position of a here. This is one of the major issues: how to transfer the leadership of the community, and this is one of the uh, debate that happened in there. When Al Walid decided to choose his two younger son, of course, uh, the, the way to do it is to bring the elites and to inform them that you wanna appoint your son. As a here and the other son after that, and he and he sent for certain uh, leader of tribes, and they rejected. And this is very important in order to understand why did he write that letter in the first place? Of course, his cousins, other Mayid princes, all refused the appointment of his sons because the two sons, one was six years, one was four years, and which means the caliphate and Al-Walid himself was around 20-something, which means the caliphate will stay in his sons for another 
more than 50 years, which means every member of the elite will not have a chance at all to be in a position. But even that is not enough reason to protest. Actually, the, the other elites, which is more important in my mind, is the tribal leaders. A couple of tribal leaders have been invited to speak with Al Walid, and Al Walid told them, I want to choose my son. I want to give Ahd to my son. And uh, the two sons. And the Umayyad uh, tribal uh, leaders said, no, both of them. Well, at least the famous two. One of them said, I cannot give Ahd to someone who I cannot pray behind. In the sense, he's so young. And he cannot be Imam. How can I swear to obey him as a caliph after you if he cannot pray in front of me? And because of that, I will not. Uh, another tribal leader did the same, refused that, and both been killed by Al Walid. However, more Umayyad princes, tribal leader, have refused such a thing. This is very important because those who dealt with the letter forget the circumstances that created such a letter. The letter was a result of such an incident. It's similar again to Morsi's speech because you cannot understand Morsi's speech unless you understand that he's losing legitimacy. And this is why he keep repeating legitimacy, legitimacy, legitimacy in his speech. And it's only when you need it, you go again about it. What did he do? He want to appoint his sons, the elite are refusing. How did the Umayyad system go? You have to have two things to be a caliph. You have to have the Ahd, which is appointment from a caliph, previous caliph, and you have to have the acceptance of the elite. In this case, the caliph had the capacity to give his sons the Ahd, but he cannot give them the acceptance of the elite, which is something even you cannot, even if with the elite, cannot even dismiss the Ahd if, if it's joined together. For example, one of the famous saying to one of the tribal leaders who refused, if you cannot accept his sons, why would you accept him? And he said, there is Ahad before me, which during Yazid time, the father of Al-Walid, there is Ahad to obey him. So I have to keep uh, the same Ahad. Again, reusing this letter by our scholars in the field, show their interest to see the religious dimension of the whole Islamic establishment. And that is desirable. Certain scholars have motive to look for magical aspect of this society. So they think when the caliph speak about God or his title, that is something you should attach to and keep searching inside. You will find the magic in this East or the magic inside this society. However, thinking again about incapable caliph to pass such thing, how good his title to be serving him in this level. There is two types of legitimacy, uh, legitimacy I argue in this, in this uh, issue. I argue that there is two types of legitimacy. There is what I call the uh, popular legitimacy. It's when you are a ruler, a caliph, and you use titles, you build mosques, you have songs, poetry about you. All of these type of issues, you build a mosque, you have uh, your name written in a certain way, you donate money for poor, for kids, all of these activities. You have your coin written something religious about it. This is I call a popular legitimacy. It will help you to be perceived as a god caliph. But in no way this type of action will give you the position. In order to achieve a position, you need a different type of legitimacy, which I call acquired legitimacy, which is the acceptance of the elite and the Ahd in the Umayyad era. So to have the seat and to run the community, you do not need titles, nor songs, nor poetry, nor activities like this. You need the elite to accept you and the caliph, the previous caliph, to give you that. And these two things 
what make you as a caliph. Too many issues in, in that article, in this letter to support my argument. Inside this letter, which I argue that this is the letter is only, the purpose of this letter is uh, one thing, is to challenge the power of the elite, the Umayyad elite. Because the letter itself, actually it's go beyond the elite acceptance of his appointment in order to go with the popular legitimacy in the sense that Al-Walid decided, if I cannot ensure the position for my sons by acquired legitimacy, which is the elite, I will use the popular legitimacy, which is I'll go for speeches, for names, for poetries. And he did that, which is media. He called it media. And again, it's the same thing that Morsi did. He went to media. He gave a speech about legitimacy. And he kept saying legitimacy, legitimacy, legitimacy. But that, does that make the difference in reality? Or it's something else? For Umayyad era, he used a tool never been used before him, Al-Walid. And he went to speak to every person inside, every Muslim inside the community using the Jum'ah prayer and sending this strange letter or khutbah or a speech where the caliph talk about many different things. In one incident that support my argument and show or at least show the context for this letter, Al-Walid go uh, in his letter saying this, فَإِذَا أَصَابَ أَمِيرِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ أَمْرِ فِي وَلِيَّ عَهْدَهِ أَوْ كِلَاهُمَا جاز له أن يختار من يرضاه من, من أمته. If something happened to Amir al-Mu'minin uh, here, to the, his son, if he died, or both of them have an accident or died or anything, the caliph is free to choose anyone from the ummah to be the caliph. That, of course, challenged the whole Umayyad establishment because it showed that the establishment is not related to a dynasty. It's a real related to a caliph choice. So the caliph sending a strong message to Umayyad emirs, Umayyad elite, Umayyad princes, that I have the right to, G to choose even outside of Umayyad establishment. And by that, Al-Walid trying to fight back, it's better for you to accept my sons who from the same establishment, Umayyad establishment, or I will go as far as that I have the right to choose anyone from the Ummah. Of course, such a sentence, very important. However, all of the scholars who dealt with this text never see this dimension of the struggle because they are focusing on something else, which is how holy is the Caliph, what is his relation vis-a-vis -vis, uh, holiness in general. The Umayyad model, in general, the way I saw it, was built in a basis that's clear and direct. And it's a realistic one. It does have, like every system, a cover, a religious cover, or ideal cover. What happened in Western scholarship, that scholars start looking to the ideal cover and thinking about it as the basis, and leaving or doing the opposite, for example, early scholars who looked to the reality uh, running of the show and they thought it's, it's a realistic approach. Actually, it's like every system, the Umayyad have two models or two type of legitimacy. And as a scholar, we should understand all together in order to get uh, the clear picture. One important thing about, about uh, both uh, Morsi and Al-Walid that both of them did not continue as uh, leaders. Both of them produced a unique speech. The unique speech is totally different. Both of them end up losing the position. So all of those scholars who work about, uh, uh, about Al-Walid letters, they forget that that letter did not go through, which mean it did, it did not establish what it was to, was to establish, which is having a here. Al-Walid was killed in a revolution by his elite. The revolution done by the Umayyad elite, princes of tribal princes and Umayyad princes have killed the caliph and declared the new caliph. Not only that, 
they killed the two young heirs because they thought they have, they have a connection to legitimacy. So Al-Walid letter, the solid and strong important evidence that scholars use, actually did not even go through. How could it be the blueprint for the Umayyad system? Important thing about the letter I should bring that it is the only letter everyone in the field except not to be fabricated or have no doubt about it. It's the only letter or many from the few that everyone agree upon, the most uh, skeptical ones in the field, they accept this letter to be authentic. It's because, of course, and I agree with them, the nature of the language, it's the way it's handled, it's, it doesn't have a previous model to build in. Too many reasons that make you sure that this is an authentic uh, letter. But it is been read wrongly and it's led to different and misleading conclusions by different scholars. Sorry for taking such a long time in, in presenting this and I'll be happy to receive more questions about it. Thank you very much. Again, what, what's the... Why, why was the pattern, yeah. you mentioned the number of instances, the pattern of appointing two heirs yeah. uh, to the caliph. So I was wondering why this particular pattern arose. Was it to make sure that the, the caliph chose one of uh, two individuals just in case one predeceased the other? Mm -hmm. um, and the second related question is, are there any examples before Al-Wali II of the heir predeceasing the caliph? Again, of what? Are Sorry. there any examples before Al-Wali II Predeceasing the caliph. What do you mean, predeceasing? I didn't. Some, somebody was appointed, but yeah. he died before he was able to take office. Yeah, Abdul Aziz is the case. Abdul Aziz is the one we gave. He was chosen as a heir uh, after Abdul Malik, but he died before he's getting the position, and where uh, Abdul Malik chose his two sons. Actually, the one who started with this is Marwan. He chose uh, Abdul Malik and chose uh, Abdul Aziz. And after that, Al Walid chose uh, Abdul Malik, chose Al-Walid and Sulaiman. Why exactly did they do that? I think most of us, we like all of our sons, but however uh, capable, you will usually pick one and two. And that's something sound good in that time because you like your son more than your grandson, usually this is the case. So with them appearing in front of you, you choose two. And I don't know exactly how, uh, why a specific reason was it uh, bland for a different, we have nothing in the sources about it. It's, we have it like this, that he chose this and that and the other one, all of them did the same. Not only that, for example, uh, Suleiman chose Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. And that is the one with logic because Umar ibn Aziz is his cousin and he chose his cousin after that his brother. And it's been said he chose his cousin and his brother after that to make sure that the caliphate will go back to his brothers because they will protest taking the caliphate to the other line of the dynasty. You mentioned that um, Walid's letter didn't go through and that the elite killed his sons. Did they kill his sons because they found that his letter actually had legitimacy to it? That someone could, a caliph can choose whoever he wanted? Yeah, actually, this is, the, this is a very important point. That's true, it's the son was killed because they thought he have, he have certain he, uh, rights. Because, you know, what's happened? The revolution did not succeed because the new revolution done by his uh, cousins lacked the legitimacy because another part of the elite, which is another cousin of the Umayyad, have revolt against those who revolt. And he took Mar Marwan Muhammad, took his army, and went to Damascus because he said, I will not accept it, this new uh, reality. And in his way, the new caliph, declared caliph, he felt that those two child still have, a, or he came to protect them, or claiming that he accept their legitimacy. Then they decided to kill them before he reached. And they killed them before he reached. 
uh, Damascus. And that's true, which means certain people recognize them. At least Marwan bin Muhammad, he recognized recognize the sons to be. But, and that is more deep because he have interest himself to rule and that's he monopolized this whole issue. You have another question? Yeah, my, my second question is that Elohim II, according to architectural historians, is the wine loving, almost heretic. I'm sure you're familiar, of course, with him <laughs> with Lovejoy. And, and recently, Qusayr Amr has been dated conclusively to the reign of Elohim II. And so, in a sense, the architecture just seemed to enhance Support. that side of his personality. But I wonder whether that was actually part of of that same approach of the letter to acquire a form of legitimacy through the construction of these palaces. Yeah. Actually, for, uh, for the moral character of Al-Walid, uh, we should remember that it's, it's the, the person who been used as a model of how bad a caliph can go. And, and it's all weird stories have been said about him. And for me, I think he is the only person that two type of uh, propaganda worked against him. First, his his Umayyad, so the opposition, religious opposition in Medina and Iraq, usually will attack him. That's because this is for all the caliphs. Right now, this guy is the he have received attack from the opposition in Medina or in Iraq. But add to that another propaganda tools, which is the government propaganda tool, which is the Umayyad during Hisham. So he received this guy who been attacked by opposition, attacked by the government, and not only that, when he ruled, he ruled only for a few months, then a revolt. After the revolt, the new system started again to present the same material against, because you cannot legitimize a revolt without attacking the moral character of the caliph. So he's the guy who, for major uh, or, or most of the narration will tell you a different stories. Among them, that he bought Al-Quran, a famous story that he, he bought Al-Quran and start throwing arrows into the Quran and saying, okay, if you so mighty, if, if Allah the so mighty is the one who sent you, tell him that Al-Walid is the one who rape you off. Let me see what can he do. And he said it, I try to translate it, but he said it in a, in a very poetic way that you will say this is very interesting. However, seeing someone like Stephen Judd, who go the opposite to say this is a very religious guy and this is he is God fearing and he give us a Jum'a prayers speech and the two things are, are too much. He, that's you cannot create a stories of drinking that bad if he cannot drink at all. You, you need a material, even even a legend need needs something to build in it. So of course Al Walid have certain thing that opposition use because opposition usually do not create they try to find some weakness in you and build in them and they found certain things in the walid character and building them for for his 
castle, of course, represent him, but see a previous castles did the same have painting and it seemed to have luxurious uh, the same. However, did not uh, these characters did not receive the same material about him. So it's very interesting how to see it and how did Stephen Judd saw the whole thing, which is also more hard than to believe. Rasal al Abdul Malik, you said the Rasal Abdul Malik. I'll go back to an aerial stage, very important incident where uh, Muawiyah sent letters to take Bay'ah to Yazid. And this is maybe the first one, and maybe the only thing that went wrong with Muawiyah that he, for the first time, bring the issue of choosing the Caliph to the public. Because before Muawiyah, it's never been the issue of the public. For example, if you see Abu Bakr, it was done in a Saqif. If you see Omar, he was done by in, in a meeting inside uh, Abu Bakr campus. If you see Uthman, it was done by uh, six person ch uh, chosen by Omar. If you see even Ali, it was done by an elite who came to Ali in Medina. If you see Al Hassan in Kufa, which is the only practice we have a chosen caliph in Kufa, it was done by the elite, Ali groups in Kufa. Muawiyah is the only person who decided to seek support from the people by sending, asking Bay'ah before his death to his son and the creation the idea of Ahir. And that in itself was the only thing that brought this issue to discussion, public discussion. And every city did discuss should Yazid become a caliph or not. And that what make it very hard to uh, Al Walid uh, to Yazid because it became an issue. Before that, the caliph been chosen, and after one month in another city, they will receive the news. However, the, for the first time, it was done with Muawiyah to send the letter. But what I mean by this, what different between Al Walid letter and Muawiyah letters? I mean the content itself, because we know that he sent. We know it's a narrative. But the language doesn't reflect what did Muawiyah really said, and we're not sure it's really the same wording. However, Al-Walid letter, no, we're sure that, or we accept generally that it's, this is the same wording, it's the same letter. It's and such a very long story, it's around three pages uh, as, as, as a speech, which is unique in itself. Again? with Muawiyah, and this is why he is Muawiyah, very important, because actually this is what I call a bridge in the Muslim idea, uh, ideals. It's, it's the bridge out of the, uh, the utopia or the caliphate or the rightly guided. It is the way out was Muawiyah, building his son as a hero and choosing him, and this is the creation of kinship, and there is too many uh, religious stories about that, the prophet even told about that this will happen and certain person who will create the kingship and all the negative sides of the kingship are, are in general in Islam with, with Muawiyah starting. Sir, I said you have something. Well, lots of thoughts come through my head and thank you for that wonderful talk. Um, I want you to think about this letter, actually this discussion about the Mansur, uh, who is uh, you know, the second of Basra Kebek, so it's not long after al and there's this issue of the appointment of Isa ibn Musa, who was supposed to be the next uh, caliph. And Isa was appointed by the first caliph, was Safa. Um, so it's supposed to be Mansur appointed by Safa and Isa. Uh, and Isa. And of course, Mansur wants uh, Mahdi to be the king. So we were back to the same issue. And I was earlier thinking that these discussions about legitimacy are grounded in the issue of gaining political power. For example, if you have the right to rule from God, then you can choose whomever you wish, presumably. But if you need the people's uh, approval, then as you were saying, then that right is not uh, unconditional, it's not absolute. So this seems to be two sides of, uh, of a dichotomy, and they're two binary opposites. But I think in the letter of Mansur, the, the way it's discussed, I think something gets more complicated. Uh, what is said there, there are two parties, and one of the parties says that, well, if we accept the Mansur's uh, the removal of Isa from the line, then what happens to our acceptance of uh, Safa's appointment of that person? They're both caliphs, they're both given the right by God. So how is it that the right given by God to one caliph is being superseded by the, by the right being given to another caliph? Maybe the one that comes later. So in that context, how can we justify the right of Mansur 
even though it's a gone God given right. It's not an issue of getting legitimacy from the people. People are accepting his legitimacy, but they're saying that in this kind of a move, you are abrogating what the earlier caliph was doing insofar as he was given the right to do so by God. So I want you to sort of inflect, if, I, if you could kindly, to think about the issue with Al-Walid and his claims to legitimacy in light of, in light of this, well. this more complicated situation. I often think of the historiography of the Umayyads as, as you know, and, and as you're familiar with, as, as, as a back projection, as a red projection of developments that are happening in a very complex religious and historical milieu. Um, so, so yeah, I think you could sort of think about the Walid's letter in that context. Yeah, for, for example, one major thing to say about the Abbasid, that they, the Ahd in the Abbasid era was totally much easier than the Umayyad in the sense that we have too many issue, uh, cases, especially this one, the famous one, about the Mansur, and we have other cases where they dismiss the Heer and the Caliph have the right. But what's striking is the opposite, when the Umayyad cannot do it. For example, we supposed to accept that the Caliph is capable of doing too many things. If he's God, deputy in earth, he have the right to do things. But if Hisham rule for 20 years and use such a strong propaganda, and with a person similar to Al-Warid, and he do not succeed, that will tell us something about the system itself. In reality, the Caliph do not have this power. And what I'm saying, we sometimes tend to use, the, uh, uh, attract by the terms, by the theories done by artists, by poets, by scholars, by religious speakers, and that will uh, take us from the reality. Reality, the Caliph does have too many things to balance with. And in the Umayyad era, he could not pass it. The first attempt to go beyond it was Al-Walid, and he was killed. The uh, Mansur tried it and succeed, which means there is a different equation during the Abbasid time that allowed Al-Mansur to do this. Not only this, Al-Mansur did too many things. Before that, he come into a strong conflict with the Abbasid elite, and he won that conflict. Not only with the Abbasid elite, the two type of elite, Abbasid elite, with the uh, Persian elite, which is uh, 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 al Kharasani, uh, the leader of the revolution itself, was a very important leader who led the, the, the armies. He was killed by Al Mansur. His uncle, Al Mansur, also was killed. Uh, Abdullah bin Ali was killed by Al Mansur. And you see Al Mansur, what he did, and he's the, stab the real establisher of the Abbasid era and the Abbasid dynasty, he do, did two things, the beginning of the dynasty, which make it easier to do it later. He killed his uncle, which is, uh, and his uncle, one of the leader of the revolution, and he killed one of the most important leader of the Persian group inside the military, because the Abbasid revolution contained from two uh, groups, the Persians and Al-Mawali, and uh, on the other side, the Arab tribal uh, segment in the, in the region where the revolt started from, Khurasan in that time. And this two part, the leader of uh, the Persian was executed by, uh, by uh, Abu Ja'far. And that gave him strength. And also his uncle, who claimed to have the uh, right and uh, to be the grandson of, of Al-Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet, he was also executed and defeated by Abu Ja'far. That gave the leader of, or the founder of the Abbasid dynasty, the right to remove all of these people. And that kept going inside the Abbasid era. So I think there is a difference from the starting point in the Abbasid. If I might just follow up a few seconds. Mm. That doesn't explain the ideology of legitimacy. The fact that he succeeded is something that happens on the ground. But That's true. may have succeeded too. We have to look at what is being said and what different alternatives are available. What Mansur is saying in the removal or of Isa and Musa is not very different from what Al Walid is saying. And at Al Walid's time, immediately after we were left from Yazid, which is the exact opposite. It says that I have a right to rule given that I follow God's law and I'm able to declare what's lawful, lawful, and what's unlawful, law, unlawful. And Nafsa Zakiyah comes after him in the early Abbasid period, and he has the same kind of argument as Yazid. So it appears that there are two models of legitimacy. Um, but they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. And, and, and that 
Al-Walid, even though he's unsuccessful, is not necessarily unsuccessful because the ideology of legitimacy is, is different from the ideology of legitimacy of the Abbasids. It's just that the end results are different, but that's, that has to do with what happens on the ground. Yeah, I, I'm not saying it's different. It's, I, I'm saying Al-Walid uh, Al actually used the same terms that I am appointed by God, it's my right, it's, and he used the same religious terms and more, even more sophisticated the way he presented. It was very powerful the way Al-Walid presented. But the, the important thing, it did not go through, which means you can use it, but it doesn't mean it's the reality. It's again similar to my speak, uh, Morsi speak, where he sp speaks about the legitimacy. It makes sense, the legitimacy, the election and things, but did that make it for the people, and could we say this is the Egyptian ideology, the speech? It cannot be the Egyptian ideology, though he used things that very well known to the audience, and he used material of the same language that the people use, but it did not go through. And it doesn't need to be necessarily against the ideology. No, it's related to it, but it's not exactly, or cannot be the explanation or a blueprint for the ideology in that time. And I think it's actually an exceptional case of that, though it's used, of course, the same language, the same ideas, which is being used in that time. Any other questions? Yeah. A, very, a very quick uh, kind of comment uh, on this fascinating discussion. One of the things that I come across constantly in the references is that the Maksura and the Mosque is being used by governors and caliphs to seek refuge during conflict. So when you talk about this very troubled legitimacy, Ziyad ibn Abihi is pelted with pebbles in his mosque in Kufa and has to secure himself in the Maksura. Abd al-Malik in Damascus has to be locked into his Maksura and protected by his guards. So when you talk about this tension in their ability to even keep themselves safe in a public arena, it's completely aligned with what we're seeing. Uh, in the That's developments right. of the buildings and the cities as well. Um, so, so in a sense, it is complex, it is problematic, but I think your model of, of thinking about it that way is very helpful to, to start asking these questions about the different mm -hmm. forms of legitimacy and where they succeeded and where they failed. It's very interesting to see it even from buildings perspective. It's even harder to think this way, but it's very interesting to see it this way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just want to maybe you could speak a little bit more. How accurate or maybe close for us to use the Morsi example in comparison to it? It seems to be <laughs> that it's still the ink has not dried <laughs> on what happened in Egypt, and we need possibly to wait another 30 years before we could get some of the documents. <laughs> the, so the, how? The, the, how the, well, I, no. I, I was going to add to that. That is actually, I was going to ask this as my last question. Uh, why would an Umayyad historian feel the need to invoke something from the latter part, if you will, of the 21st century today uh, to be able to come up with this explanation? Yes, of course, I understand uh, Morsi holds for one year and Walid holds for one year. Morsi is removed uh, in a certain way. If we kill people today, and we do kill people today, but if Egyptians didn't kill Morsi, that was the way to deal with you know, uh, what supposedly was a removal of a kill at the time. Why do you feel that need? Actually, uh, <laughs> the truth. Uh, Is it to simplify? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, when I spoke with you, uh, I asked you about your course, and you told me it's covered the modern era mainly, and I have to appeal to the student with something that can <laughs> be uh, understandable. It's, and it wasn't my plan. I published an art, a whole article. I mentioned nothing about Morsi, <laughs> but I needed, I need to keep the audience uh, related to this discussion and. Uh, guess what? It sounds similar. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, I actually thought about it here. I never thought about it before I come. But uh, uh, we did. We talked. Uh, I asked you. Told me we study more modern things. Then I decided what Morsi seems similar, and maybe it should be an article. The, <laughs> <laughs> the Morsi al Walid case or scenario. But you realize that never had to use the term Shariah. Huh? Morsi had to, which is very telling. That's true, but I mean, your, your, your analogy has to do with the fact that Morsi's invocation of the term rhetorically was an attempt to appeal to people to say, I am here because I have certain power, powers that I actually have because I got elected. 
Al-Walid is saying the same thing without having to invoke the rhetoric in a sense, except for the letter. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he's invoking a different kind of power altogether. Yeah, but I'm saying both of them crying for the thing that they lost. Yes, of course. The Sharia Sharia yeah. speech is actually because he have a difficulty in his Sharia, yeah. which is in the mind of yeah. the elite and the thing. And the same thing Al Walid doing is talking about Ahd, 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 because his Ahd didn't go through. And this is actually it's the same need, and it makes sense to use it. This is we all do the same. The thing that we miss, keep talking about them. Maybe, <laughs> maybe it will be used again. reading of a particular text, always seeking for something already, the conclusion is made and just searching for it beforehand. So how can we push back this on Oriental's approach to the text? Actually, it's not, uh, I, I'm not, uh, this is not in, in criticism for Orientalist approach to the material itself, but for certain, uh, certain uh, desire to reach uh, uh, clashy or uh, fashionable arguments. And it makes sense I would bring an argument that uh, Morsi thought he's a prophet. That will sound very interesting if I say it now. And scholars who look for interesting thing to say usually end up saying a very interesting thing. But is it true? That's another case. So that pushes uh, scholars in the field, which I consider myself part of this field because I am discussing with the, those scholars to attract them certain things. For example, uh, uh, Stephen Judd, the poem that he used to show that, that Al-Walid called himself a Nadir and the Nasih, it's a poem that anyone read would know it belongs to the end of the Abbasid era and can no way be attributed to Al-Walid. Not only that, the same poem that uh, Stephen Judd used is a poem that it's go, the story go like this. He been asked to give the Jum'ah prayers and their hunting time. And he gave a speech. What would you expect if, if someone called you to give a, a religious speech? You will not talk about your drinking or your adventures. You will speak about a religious speech. So that doesn't make you religious. So anyone will give me a speech in anywhere. I'll speak in a way that they expect. It's a Friday prayer. Does that mean I am religious? Doesn't mean it. They asked me to give the Jum'ah prayer. I gave a poem. The poem, I will talk about what? I will not talk about wine. I'll talk about how to be good and how to be God-fearing. And that doesn't create me. However, even the silliness of the poem that it, when you read it, it doesn't have even wazin, nor the wording go ta back to the Mayyad era. It's obvious it's, it's late Abbasid fabrication. And it's done that way because in that time during the Abbasid era, when you create a story, you need a figure to hang the story with. And it will not be funny if it's done by similar, uh, a, a normal person. So usually you will pick Al-Walid because he's the model for weird thing and, and religiously. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's not criticism about the, the field in general, but about and certain intention to, uh, be, or, or uh, attitude that attracts scholars to a fancy thing. Okay. Well, thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you.